much Robert Lowe, um, Education Research Director of the Schools Project, um, and I don't really need to introduce um, the foundations of our work because you've heard them so eloquently already. We started with a, a premise that's been explored uh, this evening, that is that relationships matter. We know more now from the field of social neuroscience than we've ever done about the way that our bodies um, affect our brains and the way our brains um, affect our bodies. We know, and this is particularly true of the school's context, uh, just how important relationships are um, in order to be healthy, uh, to be happy, uh, to learn well. Um, learning is primarily um, deeply social and mutual. Um, it's not a, an individual cognitive thing. Um, but also to be successful. So when starting out in schools, um, you know, as a researcher, uh, one has to start uh, with a series of questions. Well, certainly the question wasn't, can we uh, measure relationships? Uh, nor was it, should we? Uh, actually, uh, the reason people tend not to engage in the topic of relationships, we in many schools now, and very few schools in the United Kingdom will take relationships on as a topic. Um, and that is because the 21st century culture, which is primarily uh, quantitative and not qualitative, um, means that people tend not to manage what they can't measure. This is particularly true of schools, and it's why the dominant policy narrative um, is extremely empirical in its focus. So we wanted to begin uh, with schools we already knew um, were relational. Um, in, in our gut instinct, we knew that there were um, systems, processes, structures or practices um, that meant um, that the children within them started to demonstrate some of these qualities we were looking for, as well as academic success. We wanted to promote, promote a model of schools as, as households. This um, photograph was taken from America in the 1900s, the early 1900s, and represents um, an early household. The activity they're undertaking here is, is, is homework. It's where we get our, um, it's where we get our, our, our term that is now applied in, in the education context. But what we here, have here um, is a group of people who, because of their context, um, had, uh, were both living together, working together, and subordinating self-interest in order um, that the sort of global goal um, was maintained and moved forward. Um, but schools are not like that now. By and large, schools are more like mini-societies. They're social norms. Uh, they're deeply in personal places, um, very goal-orientated, as Roy reminded us at the start. They're very much about the individual. Um, school is about my world, my life, my grades. Uh, if I get 10 A stars, why should I care about the person next to me who gets 10 E's? It's not established as a team endeavor. And actually, when we went to find schools, who practice what we might call a relational lens. We were struggling for examples, but there are many of them. And I'll come back to the school uh, that we, uh, we, we observed in a, in a detailed case, case study in a moment. But this here, this is the, the baseline uh, data we took um, from several UK uh, schools, all the way from Liverpool um, down to London. And what we found primarily, it's difficult in a context to give you um, the kind of the full rundown, but it's it, primarily what we discovered um, was that in many institutions, students did not know each other. They had no sense of shared story. They had very little time to each other, with each other. And when they spoke, even though they might speak often, they said nothing. And they had very little sense of shared value or goal or purpose. They had very little sense that when they left school, they would see the people that they'd been rubbing shoulders with day in, day out, ever again. But in the relational school, a particular school we selected um, from East Anglia, a school called Samuel Ward Academy, um, a school renowned uh, for where the children from the most materially deprived backgrounds achieve uh, in their English and math scores in the regions of 94% A star to C compared to 96% for the most materially advantaged backgrounds. There was almost no differential in performance. The children described the school as being like a family and social services locally felt that it was the go-to place to send looked after or fostered children. It is the place where they'd settle the most quickly and it's where they'd thrive. So when we measured the quality of relationships between students, 
You'll see the purple line coming up now. This is what we call oh, it's in a beautiful yellow. Uh, that's I wasn't expecting that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, that is Sammy Ward School. And in many instances, the relationships are 20 to 30 percent more effective. And particularly here, when we look at the, at the level and amount of communication, you'll see just a stark difference. Uh, in the opportunity even students had to come together and speak. But more fundamentally, um, actually when you start to interview students, you understand the differences the school uh, presented, the, the different kinds of system and process, a, a value uh, placed on the human scale environment. Tutor groups have no more than 13, whereas in many schools they range from 25 to 30, nearly twice that number. Um, schools within schools, even a school like Samuel Ward Academy, where they had 1,400 students, broken down into three schools within that one campus to make sure that everybody felt uh, and perceived to be known. And of course, we can take that and now start to create benchmark data, something that um, uh, our current government is very keen on doing. And I had the privilege this summer to go out to Australia and start to measure our first schools out there. And we went again and found a great case study school. And what we found, this is Sammy Ward Academy here, um, in the red now. Um, and if you see the Australian sample, you'll notice something quite, um, quite phenomenal, really. And that is that these studies were conducted 18 months apart from each other. Um, uh, in one instance, a sample of 750 students, in another, uh, 250. Um, but you'll note the correlations. Um, we start to think that we're recognising the patterns, almost the DNA um, of the relational school, and it's why we can start to work at the micro level um, uh, for pedagogical process. You see, when Plato uh, described pedagogy, which is now used as a kind of proxy for uh, the science of teaching, um, he never spoke about a discipline or a subject. What Plato referred to was a person. Pedagogues were people, and they would walk alongside um, a, a young child as they, as they grew, but spiritually, morally, culturally. Um, and so that's what um, our work in the classroom sought to do, to understand the kinds of relationship um, which ensure um, that young people um, can be uh, mentored in a way which allows them to grow. We made a 50-minute um, television a documentary called The Relational Teacher and a book. And it's just, um, we've just gone into reprint for a second edition of that book. Um, and if you'd like to ask about that, um, I have a few, few cheeky copies on me. Um, obviously not to detract from the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the most exciting thing, however, uh, was the impact of The Relational Teacher um, on attainment of students. What you see here um, is, is our attempt to codify some, uh, some academic progress data from a school. Um, and what we did then was we overlaid um, the relational data uh, where we measured relationships between teachers and their students. And what we found um, was, a, was a stark picture um, where relationships were functional and healthy, irrespective um, of the academic profile of a student. This is not about bright children who get on well with their teachers. This is about um, highly developed, uh, highly empathetic relational teachers who connect with all the children, even from the most fractured, um, non-intact, um, difficult contexts um, that they are coming from. And what we found was that if those children in particular um, could form one connected relationship uh, with a member of staff, then it could disconfirm all sorts of histories um, from the context in which they came, and they might flourish academically, notwithstanding. And so now we have a, a fairly good idea of what we think a relational school is, but we're only three years into this, you understand. Uh, this is our new um, film and book we're making. It launches in January. It's called We Are Crew. It's about a school up in Doncaster, um, uh, a product of a collaboration between Outward Bound uh, and Harvard Business School. Um, this is a school that take all their children away at the start of the year, all children and all their teachers, and all those uh, uh, young people and their staff go away and they have a week of Outward Bound, they have a week of uh, camping and adventure. Uh, the first one you see here is, is taken from our, uh, our film crew. Uh, it's an aerial drone footage above uh, the, the, the Welsh mountains, the children and their teachers. Um, uh, engaging activities together, and only when they're relating and connecting properly do they come back to the, uh, uh, to the classroom. Um, and that's why we call it We Are Crew, it is the motto of the school. 
We're also starting to do our work internationally. Now I fly tomorrow morning uh, very early to out to Holland where we start our first parallel research centre. We're really excited about the work, particularly in the, in the, uh, in the world of relational leadership um, by our Dutch colleagues. Um, we're beginning more consultancy work. That's a project we're about to start down in Wiltshire um, in about two weeks' time. And uh, January also sees us launch as an independent charity, the Relational Schools Foundation, so you can uh, keep a track um, on, on our new research and development um, as it grows. So that is us, the Relational Schools Foundation, applying the relational metrics of the theory of relational thinking in the context of schooling. Thank you very much. Thanks.